I'm Sudesh and I'm responsible for the communications and publications at Azim Prendi University. Uh, just in case you are wondering what happened to the familiar avuncular figure of Giri, uh, who posted these lectures in the past, he's traveling today and uh, I'm sort of standing in front. Uh, I'm now delighted to welcome you all to the 63rd public lecture being held under the aegis of the Azim Premji University. The Azim Premji University is part of the Azim Premji Foundation and our public lectures are a way to advance our vision of a just, equitable, humane and sustainable society. Our public lectures have featured a range of topics and speakers. Professor Joseph Stiglitz has been a regular. Dr. Gopalakrishna Gandhi has spoken here. Atishi Marlena has spoken here. Just to name a few people who have spoken at this forum. But for a two-year interruption caused by COVID, we have tried to organize six to eight lectures every year. We have now started these lectures in Bhopal too, where our second university has just come up. Today we have uh, great pleasure in presenting to you Jerry Rao. I think he prefers being called just Jerry and I will also take the liberty of calling him so. I have followed Jerry since 1989 when he visited my campus in Calcutta in his role as the country head of Citibank. Over the past three decades, I have heard him speak on a variety of topics, including the software industry, the Indic traditions, and most recently on Gandhi. He is undoubtedly one of the few polymaths in our country, the few polymaths that our country is fortunate to have. So when I emailed him a few months ago and requested him to speak on Gandhi the Economist, which is the topic of his book, he suggested an edit and said he would prefer to talk on Gandhi the intellectual. I told him Gandhi and the topic sit very well with our university's vision of a just, equitable, humane and sustainable society. He said he is fine with the just, humane and sustainable part of it, but may have some reservations about the equitable part of it. I am not sure if he will clarify what he meant by this in his talk today, but it will surely be interesting to know from him. These talks are typically structured as a, a 50 minute to an hour of lecture followed by 30 minutes of Q&A and the Q&A is very often uh, very very interesting so please do stay on. Uh, we should be done around 6 p.m. All our lectures are recorded and made available on our university's YouTube channel and from the past trends we know that for every one of you who physically attends this talk there are 15 more who watch this online. Jerry's bio was there as part of the invitation, so I am taking it as read and now have the honor of inviting him to speak. Hang on to your seats. I know it will be one hell of a ride. Jerry. Thank you, Sudesh. Appreciate that very much. Um, when I first got invited, I actually indicated a preference for Bhopal because I hadn't been to Sanchi in a long time and I thought that would give me an excuse to see something in the heart of our country which is worth saying but Bengaluru is what it is and since I come here frequently it's it's uh, it's, it's a familiar place um, Gandhi the important thing about him is that he's more than just Indian when we read our intellectuals, starting with Ramon and Monkim, Tagore, Nehru, Tagore has a little bit more maybe, but Rajagopalachari, Ambedkar, they are all relevant for us. They are all relevant for India. Do they have universal relevance? And I think this is an important point that Ram Guha makes in his book that there is something universal about Gandhi's appeal and his message. It is interesting that Narendra Modi in his recent speech inviting the G20 ministers 
said, welcome to the land of Buddha and Gandhi. So it's almost kind of you have a bookends between Buddha and Gandhi in terms of the intellectual uh, contributions of our country. So first is that there is a universality about Gandhi. And we'll talk about that both in the political sphere and elsewhere. The second thing is that we look at Gandhi either as a politician or as a saint. And we look at him through contemporary eyes either from a political or from a cultural perspective. And I think that diminishes Gandhi. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. But to stop there and not to talk about some other aspects of the man and his contributions, we diminish Gandhi. Politically, basically Gandhi is seen by the British story writers as a seditious person who destroyed their empire and was probably not very constructive, fasting all the time and creating hartals and so on. The British left sees him as a kind of very important representative of the oppressed Indian masses. It's in fact George Orwell, who was neither of the left nor the right, who got it correct when he said in his essay on Gandhi, Gandhi is one of us. Essentially, the British see Gandhi as one of themselves. And there is a reason for that. We, can, we will come back to that. The Indian economic left hates Gandhi because they see him as a friend of the rich Birla and Sarabhai and Lalbhai and Jagmalal Bajaj and, and is in fact uh, an apologist for the rich. Uh, and uh, an apologist for imperialism as nonviolence was all bogus and so on. So the Indian political and economic left dislikes Gandhi on that basis. The Indian cultural left dislikes Gandhi because they find him too vegetarian, Hindu, cow loving, etc. Not, not what they would consider cool. And in recent times, which I think there is a valid objection to Gandhi, the feminists have taken strong objection to some of Gandhi's bizarre experiments with young women, which nobody can defend. And I don't think we should try to. It's, it's, it seems to be a fairly lunatic behavior of an old man. Um, and that has to be acknowledged and put on the side. The Indian economic right has always been worried about Gandhi's Luddite, anti-industrial, pro-village view of the world and said, hey, this is not going to take us to prosperity, to riches. We have to uh, ignore the old man. The Indian cultural right basically feels that Gandhi's silence during the Mopla riots, his excessive appeasement of Jinnah, etc., uh, and, and his kind of inability to connect with certain aspects of our culture make him a persona non grata. So everybody in the Indian sphere and in the British sphere, as I've said, I think the interesting thing to take a look at is what do the French, the Germans, the Russians and the Americans think of Gandhi? For the Americans, is a kind of acute poster figure, Attenborough's movie. They put him on the cover of Time. I don't know if you know, in 1930s, they put him on the cover of Time magazine. Um, and some kind of connect with Martin Luther King. That's what they see in Gandhi. Um, they don't know much details. Uh, but it's, it's surprising that they don't. Because some of the best, Gandhi's best biographers have been Americans, William Shira, Vincent Sheehan, Louis Fisher, and the person who photographed him best, Margaret Bourke White, was a photographer for Life magazine. So, um, but that's where they come. Uh, and then the French, I think, think of him as some kind of a 
quasi-religious figure from India, you know, a little bit like cool Buddhism for the 20th century. Uh, so there's, there's, there's never been serious intellectual appreciation of Gandhi. Now, let's come back to the saint and politician issues. Politician is taken quite seriously. Everybody agrees that Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Lech Walesa, they were all influenced by Gandhi. And in a lot of universities in a political science course, there will be a section on Gandhi, particularly Gandhi as a political strategist, using nonviolence as a strategy, not as a political philosopher. You don't look at uh, Gandhi the way you would look at a Locke or a Hobbes or a Montesquieu, but more as a strategist. The saint business has particularly in recent times been embraced by environmentalists and I'll talk about that later. But otherwise, saintliness today is at a serious discount, particularly after all the revelations of some of his uh, unsavory experiments. But all of this limits the man. And that's the principal hypothesis I'm working with this evening, is that Gandhi is universal, yes, he has an appeal across the world, not just for Indians. But his appeal that we should be concerned about in this year, 2023, is his intellectual appeal. And what does that mean? When we talk about intellectual traditions, we talk about going back to Plato and the Republic, going back to Aristotle and the ethics and the aesthetics. We go back. That's what intellectuals are. And of course, in recent times, uh, in the 19th century, a Marx or a Freud or whatever. Uh, we don't put Gandhi in that, in that bracket. He's seen as a practitioner of politics, a strategist of importance, a charismatic figure, but not as an intellectual. And I would argue that that is a big mistake. His universal appeal, in fact, I would say, is sustained by the intellectual contribution of the man. And I propose today to talk about three areas of his intellectual contribution. One is the whole political economy of trusteeship. The second is the area of human capital development and education. The third is the area of identity economics. I will make a one-sentence passing reference to Gandhi's views on androgyny, actually his practice of androgyny, but I am not going to cover that today. If you really want that covered, you've got to buy my book. Let's start with, when, you, when, when, you, when we talk about Karl Marx, what do we say? The first thing we say is, where did he get his ideas from? Who influenced him? Oh, Hegel, Fichte, Schelling. You know, we make the list. When we talk about, you know, any philosopher, when we talk about Spinoza, we say, hey, what did he get out of Plato? What did he get? So there's always an intellectual lineage that is taken. And particularly in India, that's very important. Your lineage, in for Vedantins, all lineage has to start with Vyasa and Badarayana. And then you bring it down. Okay, this, this, this. Mandana Mishra, Vachaspati Mishra, Shankara. You have to get, get it that way. And that's the way philosophers are studied. Even the odd philosophers who really fall outside mainstream intellectual stuff like a Schopenhauer or a Nietzsche, really we go back and look at where did they get their ideas from. And it's amazing how much Nietzsche got. Nietzsche got from the, the Neoplatonists. It's not true that he was uninfluenced and a lonely genius who suddenly came up in Germany. So where did Gandhi get his ideas from? And what were these ideas? Let's first talk about trusteeship. The point that I'm trying to make is that trusteeship is not a trivial idea. 
The communists used to make fun of Gandhi saying, hey, this is all bogus, you're trying to defend the rich people saying become trustees. No rich person is ever going to become a trustee. And yet, we are speaking at Azim Premji University. So maybe there is some merit to what Gandhi said. This idea that rich people are incorrigible is, is, is something that Gandhi would not have accepted. The, and it's only when you understand his intellectual lineage will you understand trusteeship. And why is trusteeship important? It is particularly important because starting 1980, we have embraced loosely what you might call the Reagan-Thatcher view of the world. And the Reagan-Thatcher view of the world is a certain kind of market fundamentalist view of the world. Now if you go back, and I've gone back and looked at how did people defend it. Actually, in fairness, both Reagan and Thatcher defended it, not saying it works, it's efficient, but it's morally good and it promotes freedom. But everybody around Reagan and Thatcher, the World Bank and all these people, they defended it saying this is a superior system to socialism, this is a superior system to state planning. The less state intrusion there is, the more efficient the outcomes for society. So the doctrine of efficiency is really the big pillar on which modern market capitalism stands. Very few people talk about the moral imperatives of market capitalism. It's very unusual, but it's true. Even today, if you listen to C-SPAN, you listen to any American uh, legislator talking, basically they'll say social security doesn't work, it works. The, the idea is what is what works. A very empirical, not, not a bad way of looking at the world, but it's a way that denies the human being's interest in morality. That's the, the real problem. Because even though we want to, we are all people who seek efficiency, for some reason deep inside our consciousness, we also seek justice. We also seek some kind of idea, right? Robert Browning says, ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's the heaven for. So we all seek that. And in that seeking, the 1980 Reagan-Thatcher market capitalism, global globalization, all this, what is called Washington consensus, etc., fails the test. It is only an efficiency test that it passes. Now that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's efficient. We do it. Except after 2008, that's no longer true. 2008 proved that this damn thing may not be all that efficient also. See, the crisis of modern market capitalism comes up in 2008. And if you look at all the editorials criticizing the events of 2008, the fall of Lehman Brothers and uh, Northern Rock and whatever, the, the entire vocabulary is moral. Greed, excessive greed, greedy people, unethical people. That's the entire vocabulary, even in the public press. Even in absurdly low-grade, you know, uh, television channels, that's what the talk is about. So the, the entire human reaction, the reaction of people to 2008 has been a moral reaction. And yet, what is the response? The response has been entirely technocratic, entirely managerial, no moral response. The Congress of the United States passes Sarbanes-Oxley, a thousand page new law and basically threatens CEOs, you'll go to jail if you don't do this, if you don't comply with that. It's, it's really a, a monstrosity, but it's a technical response. If we do this, then people won't be greedy, which we know is absurd. People will game the law, they will find ways around it. Then banks are in trouble, you pass Frank Dodd. Frank Dodd is very interesting, it's an 800 page law without its appendices. 
It substituted a 30-page Glass-Steagall Act of 1932. So what our ancestors in 1932 could do in 32 pages, President Obama had to do in 800 page pages in our time. 800 pages without the appendix. So you can imagine how long Frank Dodd is. It's all again detailed technocratic response. There is no moral response. And I think this is a big danger to market capital. To say that it works well, we can build better roads, we can waste less money, that's all true. Soviet Union wasted a lot of money building roads to nowhere. People's Republic of China has built ghost cities, wasting a lot of money. I'm not saying that socialism works better than market capitalism, but I'm just saying because market capitalism works well within a certain range of stuff, doesn't make it morally attractive. You have to also have moral attraction. And to that credit, Reagan and Thatcher did uh, understand that, although they, in my opinion, they failed to emphasize it enough in their public communications. So I am arguing that trusteeship is not, a, there's no complete answers, right, in human matters. If there were complete answers, Plato would have given them. There are no complete answers. There are insights, there are approaches, there are journeys we can make. And I'm arguing that the Mahatma produce, uh, provides some unique insights that can help us deal with the current conundrums of market capitalism in the moral area. And, you know, Gandhi is dismissed as a tactician, right? Salt March is a tactic. People seem to forget that actually Gandhi is in very good company when we are talking about the moral imperatives underlying market capitalism. He's in the company of no less a person than the father of economics, Adam Smith. Everybody is acquainted with the Wealth of Nations, published 1776, same year as the US Declaration of Independence, and everybody is acquainted with one sentence in the Wealth of Nations. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, they don't work for your welfare, but for their own welfare, but they end up contributing to everyone's welfare, right? Selfishness is good. This is the one sentence that everybody latches on to. Nobody knows that 10 years before Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith published an extraordinary book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. He was first a moral philosopher before he became an economist and the father of economics. And in, in The Theory of Moral Sentiments, there's an extraordinary idea called the idea of the impartial spectator which is that each human being judges himself or herself. It's interesting. Even a murderer will justify what he is doing. They, they, it's, it's a very extraordinary thing, but you will find. Even Xi Jinping will say, what I am doing is good. He will never say, it's bad, but I enjoy doing it. It's, 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 it's almost impossible. People do. How do they judge themselves according to Adam Smith? There's an impartial spectator standing there, an imaginary person that I am trying to please. I am trying to obtain the praise of this impartial spectator. And that is how we develop our ethical basis, our way of living. See the parallel between this and Gandhi's still small voice of conscience. Neither of these philosophers is suggesting that we should be good and pay our taxes because the king is saying so, the state is saying so, the law is saying so. But we should do these kinds of things if we feel that the impartial spectator or the inner voice of conscience tells us to do it. In his brilliant summary in uh, the Ahmedabad District Court uh, when Gandhi was tried, 
That's what he's trying to say. It's not that, you know. It's the law that I'm breaking deliberately and consciously because I am appealing to a higher law. And that's the impartial spectator, the still small voice of conscience. Adam Smith and Gandhi had many other similarities. They, uh, Adam Smith hated the East India Company. Gandhi spent most of his life fighting the successor state of the East India Company. And Smith hated this East India Company for very similar reasons that Gandhi puts out in Hind Swaraj. Smith said, you can't give the right to rule a country to a company. It doesn't work like that. Because the country should be ruled in the interests of the people of that country. In other words, a ruler is a trustee who is going to rule on behalf and for the sake of the people of that country. And no joint stock company is ever going to do that. And I think Gandhi's views in Hind Swaraj are quite similar. If you look at a lot of Gandhi's, Hind Swaraj is not even addressed to the British. It's addressed to Indian collaborators with the British. Saying as long as you collaborate with them, this country is going to remain poor. It's going to remain weak. So the, the idea that the people of this country or the people of any country require a trustee to be in charge of it. And I'll come back to that. It's a very important concept. It goes back to very ancient Indic ideas. Is another parallel between Adam Smith and Gandhi. And by the way, both of them were clear supporters of free markets. And uh, since you mentioned, I don't want to forget equity. Equity is one of those absurd woke words that I find quite sad, actually. This is what Gandhi says. My idea of society is that while we are born equal, meaning that we have the right to equal opportunity, all have not the same capacity. It is, the nature of it is in the nature of things impossible. For instance, all cannot have the same height or color or degree of intelligence etc. Therefore, in the nature of things, some will have the ability to earn more and others less. People with talents will have more and they will utilize their talents for this purpose. I would allow a man of intellect to earn more. I would not cramp his talent. And I have added a sentence below that. A better consequentialist case for not converting equality of opportunity into equality of outcomes cannot be made by the most ardent free market economist. This problem of equality of outcomes is something that Gandhi rejects, as also he rejects. I, I pulled this quotation while you were talking. I went back to that page. But there are many others where he rejects state intrusion, state planning. He is for enterprise, free enterprise of people to create wealth. But where he makes the big intellectual leap is not in the creation of wealth but is in the use of wealth. And we'll come to that, why he makes that. So we are looking, obviously Gandhi never met Adam Smith, but there is a, an extraordinary correlation, an extraordinary equality of depth in their thinking. It's not that, you know, Smith is a greater thinker or Gandhi a greater thinker. They're actually at the same level. Where did Gandhi get his ideas from? I said, when you look at Marx, you look at where he got his ideas from. I've kind of looked beyond the traditional ones. Every biography of Gandhi will say, oh, he read Thoreau. He picked up civil disobedience from there. Somebody gave him a copy of John Ruskin's Unto This Last. He read it on a train journey. And Ruskin is not considered a serious intellectual in Western intellectual traditions. So again, it's kind of seen secondary. And then he um, uh, corresponded with this kind of eccentric Russian literary genius, Tolstoy, a Russophilic, peasant-loving, kind of strange genius. Uh, that's what we talk about. I'm saying we need to go beyond that. And our textbooks, when we look at Gandhi, have to look deeper into trying to understand where he got his ideas from. 
the first and I think in many respects the most important is English common law. We tend to forget he was a barrister. Of course, Winston Churchill called him a middle temper lawyer dressed like a half-naked fakir. Churchill was right about the half-naked fakir. He was wrong about middle temple. Gandhi went to the inner temple. But in any case, he was a barrister. And English common law is where he drew most of his ideas from. You look at his representation in Champaran. You look at his, uh, as I said, response to the Ahmedabad District Court. These are burning with Magna Carta. They are really all about English common law. And in English common law, there is a peculiar concept called trusteeship. It is not there in continental law, in Code Napoleon, etc. It's, it's pretty unique to this island country. It started in the Middle Ages when knights would go to the Crusades and they were not sure they'd come back. So they would give their property to a friend and say, you manage it and uh, make sure my family is taken care of. And like, if I do come back and the Lord protects me, I will then take back the property. When some of them came back, they basically found that there wasn't any property left. It had all been sold off, it had all been encroached, whatever. So they went to the king and said, you know, this is not working. That's when English trusteeship law started. The king created a separate court, not the regular civil court, called the Court of Chancery, which was responsible for a new idea called equity. Equity is goes beyond the letter of the law. Under the letter of the law, if I stole money that my friend had entrusted to me, you may not be able to prove it, that I stole it. I just said I had a good time. You know, all the trustees got together and had parties every year. That, that's not stealing. Equity says, no, we are not interested in the letter of the law. We are interested in when the letter of the law doesn't provide full justice, then the king of the realm, through the court of chancery, will ensure that equity is done. So here the trustee has a fiduciary obligation that exceeds the letter of the law. He must manage the estate given to him on behalf of the beneficiaries for their welfare. So I am going to die soon. So I give my estate and trust to a good friend and say, hey, take care of my children. His job is to make sure that he acts beyond the letter of the law in fiduciary responsibility towards my children. That is trusteeship. And it's one of the great gifts of common law. Equity this concept under which it comes is not there. In fact, many continental lawyers get very upset. For them, the letter of the law is what is important. You know, you have to follow the letter of the law. How can you say no? It's interesting, uh, our Indian constitution is the only written constitution in the world which has Article 142, which is a, uh, for equity, which the Supreme Court is allowed to give certain judgments in the interests of equity. It says so specifically. So, after the Waqf board has lost its case in Ayodhya, they are not entitled to the land. Under 142, the Supreme Court said, now, as a matter of equity, we will give you 10 acres. So, that is where you go beyond the letter of the law. You take a property dispute and make it into an equity issue. And you see that one of Gandhi's favorite books, books was Snell's Equity. He carried it along with the Gita. In fact, the first time he read the Gita uh, in uh, Edwin Arnold's translation, he immediately saw the parallel between the Gita and uh, Snell's Equity. He, say, he says so himself. I am not saying this. Mahatma himself has said it. And this is the first source of his ideas, English common law. The second source of ideas, again, which has not been explored at all, it's been ignored, is the Gujarati Baniya tradition. 
The Gujarati Banya tradition is very interesting. They are all over Gujarat and parts of Rajasthan. Step wells, I don't know if you know. Step wells are built by rich people. Not for their benefit, they are not going to drink that water. But for future generations benefit. It's an intertemporal, it's trusteeship across generations, intergenerational trusteeship. In South India too you will find inscriptions uh, uh, and temple tanks saying so and so lady gave money for maintenance of this tank. So and so king or so and so chieftain gave money for this well to be dug or this rest house to be built, this Haramshala to be built, this Chatram to be built. So the idea, this is very deeply embedded in Gujarat and uh, one of the oldest trusts of this kind is the Ananji Kalyanji Trust. All the Shwetambar Jain temples in that part of the country are managed by this trust. It goes back 400 years. We have actual records in the firm's hands going back 300 years, but we know it, it definitely goes back to the 1600s. So I was talking to the current trustee, Sabbek Lalbhai, and he said, listen, the Ranakpur temple the trust doesn't own it. I said, what do you mean? Title deed is in the name of the trust. He said, no, the temple belongs to Adinath. The trust's job is just to manage the temple. It belongs to the deity, the statue inside the temple. So this is a very old Indian idea. Of course, the Jains have completely crystallized it in the Ananji Kalyanji Trust. And Gandhi, when he chose to live in Ahmedabad, he has written a long piece, one of which is, I am a great admirer of Ananji Kalyanji Trust, I want to live there and I want to learn from them and I want to make this idea something that India can contribute to the world. Even there, the old man was being universal, not just an idea for Ahmedabad or India, but for the world. This is a very deep tradition. The um, trustee it's so elaborate the previous trustee Kasurbhai Lalbhai was so obsessed with the idea that one of his descendants may not be worthy that he has done an elaborate kind of thing to make sure that the trust will always pass on to worthy people and one of his ancestors the famous Shantilal Chaveri, when some invaders were attacking Ahmedabad city, he paid them off from his personal wealth and saved the city. That's when he got the title of Nagar Shet. Uh, it was given by common consent, saying, you, th this is trusteeship that Gandhi admired. And that's something that he picked up from there. The third piece where Gandhi picked up his idea of trusteeship comes from the Ishavasi Upanishad. In two brilliant speeches he made, one at Koteam and one at Koilon, Gandhi has gone on record that if every single scripture of the Hindus is lost and if only the first stanza of the Ishavasi Upanishad survives, then Hindu culture will survive. So that's a pretty strong endorsement. What is there in the Ishavasi Upanishad that, that, that's so important for the deriving of his intellectual ideas? The opening line basically says that the universe is, the moving universe is pervaded by the Spirit of the Lord. Ishavasi Midam Sarva. So that is the root of trusteeship. Because the universe doesn't belong to you. It's, it's pervaded by the spirit of the Lord. This hall doesn't belong to me. This building, it's, it's simply a, entrusted to me. And this is a, and the, the, it, a, Kasya Swindhana, it ends with saying, do not covet other people's wealth. But it also says, enjoy what the universe has given you. So it's not uh, kind of ascetic. It is actually quite a positive statement on wealth and the use of wealth. 
And of course, there are so many commentaries. Ishala says one of the ten Upanishads on which Adi Shankara himself wrote a commentary. So that makes it a very important book. So many subsequent people have written. You can look at it all over the place. But Gandhi, but Gandhi's Sanskrit was very limited. He didn't know Sanskrit. He got most of this from English translations, usually Theosophical Society translations. Uh, although the uh, Bhagavad Gita he got from Edwin Arnold's translation. He did learn a little bit of Sanskrit in uh, the jails. So he remarked to somebody that British jails have their uses. Uh, typical Mahatma remark. Uh, the, so we've got English law, we've got Gujarati Baniya, we've got Ishavasya. Then we've got the Gospels. Gandhi knew both Mark and Matthew by heart. Absolutely by heart. And you can, in random speeches, in random articles in Harijan, you will suddenly say, find this direct, of course he doesn't even bother to put it in inverted commas many times, it's just there that he's taken it from Mark or Matthew. And the best introduction to Gandhi's economic ideas and the influence of the Gospels is a 1916 speech he gave at the Mio College Alabad Economic Society, where he refers to Christ as the greatest economist of his age. And he's able to combine this Ishavasya and the gospel. Where wealth is not bad, the parable, the parable of talents tells you that if you are given talents, you should use them well to acquire more talents, to acquire wealth, improve wealth. But if wealth becomes an obsession, thou canst not serve God and mammon too. Mammon is this kind of evil ogre in charge of wealth. This is Christ's words. So wealth has to be seen as instrumental. It has to be used. It's not bad. It's in fact good to acquire it. But if you use it stupidly, that is what will prevent you from passing through the eye of the needle and entering the kingdom of God. So, pick up some of his most ideas. I, I strongly recommend to everybody, and if Azim Premji University for its students should do as prescribed reading that whole speech. Now, it's not a long speech, but the 1916 Muir College speech, M-U-I-R, Muir College, the Economic Society speech, and you can see the man's erudition. He knows the Gospels, he knows Shakespeare, he knows Darwin, Wallace. I mean, the range of quotations he's able to bring in there. That's what I'm saying, he's a serious intellectual. He's not just a langot wearing holy man that we see in statues. He's, this man is in the same league as some of the great intellectuals of human history. And we have to think of it that way. Then, of course, we can never run away in India from the Gita, right? Was Gita influential for Gandhi? And strangely enough, it was. Because most of his political opponents said, yeah, this is a tract encouraging people to go to war. What are you? You know, this bogus, non-violent saint saying that you like the Gita. You're, you're, it, it's, it's a travesty. That's how many people used to make fun of Gandhi's. Gandhi read the Gita Edward Arnold's translation, uh, Song Celestial. And this has got a very important bear. Scott Barton, the American historian, talks about this the best. But he looks at it the best. Edwin Arnold was a high church and so his translation of the Gita is really a high church Anglican Protestant translation. It sounds almost like um, Isaiah or not, not New Testament. It sounds almost like because the Old Testament is what uh, the Protestants loved. It sounds like that. That's the, the, the language, the vocabulary, the cadence with which. And you can see that the approach there is action and uh, uh, which is very important for Protestants. Max Weber, the German sociologist, when looking at 
this idea of Protestant ethic. He basically said, one reason Northern Europe, which is Protestant, progressed in capitalism as against Southern Europe, which is Catholic, is that the Protestant had the Protestant work ethic, which was to work and create wealth, but not spend it ostentatiously. The Protestant ethic was very clear. You don't spend wealth ostentatiously. No Protestant prelate would build the Sistine Chapel, which Pope Julius thought was perfectly okay to do. So the, the, that is where Gandhi gets his Gita from. This is very important to understand. Today I know it's fashionable to criticize English Orientalists and so on. But I think it's, it's so what? Many of us have got our Gita from Krishna maybe, who from somebody else who was at Oxford. So it's not as if we've not been influenced by these different transmissions. And that is why there is this Think about, he rejects traditional asceticism from Gandhi. He talks about a sober asceticism, which is more or less what Max Weber talks about. Which is, if you look at his ashrams, normally where do we have ashrams in India? We have them in Himalayas, in the forests. <laughs> that won't do for lawyer Gandhi. He starts one first in Kokra, which is pretty much in Ahmedabad. And then he moves just um, west of the Sabarmati, uh, at that time still a budding suburb. Now, of course, it's part of the town. But it's very much in urban India. It's not in the Himalayas. It's not in a forest. His phoenix is just outside Durban. You know, if you look at all of that, it's a worldly asceticism. Where you do not live ostentatiously. You live simply but you are part of this world and you are doing service in this world. And Sevagram, Sevagram is back in the center of India. I mean, these are not accidents. Nothing about the Mahatma is accident. He planned everything. Sometimes he gave them crazy justifications, but these were planned actions. And this worldly asceticism, Anthony Perez, uh, who is from Canada, but now lives in Canada, has done some of the best work on this, where he says that Gandhi went back to the Indian Purusharthas, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. And Gandhi specifically said, focus on salvation or Moksha has been excessive in Hindu traditions. We should focus on Dharma and Artha. And he was very much on focus on political economy imbibed, imbued with virtue which is Artha in Dharma. So we have the range of influences that this man has taken. But it doesn't end there. These are specific intellectual influences. But there are other kinds of little streams here and there that Gandhi connects with. Trusteeship says that the asset doesn't belong to you. It, and as Gandhi quietly said, it said, the man who has it is entitled to earn it. He was totally against rapacious high taxation and the state stealing people's wealth. He was against that completely. He's gone on record repeatedly. But having acquired it, how are you going to spend it? What, how do you, do you fall in love with it so that you become a slave of wealth? Or do you keep that ascetic distance which is there in the Gita, which the Upanishad enjoins and which Matthew and Mark enjoin. Do you keep that distance and then do you act like a trustee in the English common law sense? Gandhi being the empiricist he is, he'll give you both arguments. He'll give you both arguments. First he'll tell you, listen, if you become a slave of wealth, you will suffer. You will go mad. Of course, you won't go to heaven. That's the kind of moral argument. Then he says, if you are excessively attached to wealth, then your own servants are going to attack you one day and take your wealth away. There will be a revolt. So this poor, like they did in 1789 or... India, if you do behave 
behave sensibly. So he's giving you both arguments. Then he's saying, don't leave too much money to your children. If you do, you'll spoil them. Give them education. He's very, he's very clear about all these ideas about how wealth should be instrumental. That there's a brilliant, I mean, I think Bill Gates would have loved it, brilliant quotation somewhere where he says, it, it's unrealistic to expect a rich man to give you 100% of his wealth in charitable causes, but if he gives 50, 75%, take it and be happy. Don't, don't insist on taking all his wealth. If you do, then he will resist. It, it's, uh, so there's this combination of morality and the potential empiricity. That's the brilliance of the man. Very similar to Smith. Smith repeated there's a moral dimension to it and there's a practical efficiency dimension to it. Then in one of his lectures to socialists, that's one of the funniest ones, he says, don't do all this socialism business, Baba. It's bad, it's immoral. You're trying to take away people's money. That's hard-earned money that they have earned. But having said that, let me also tell you one thing. If you push your luck and try to have a socialist revolution in India, don't underestimate the rich people. They will gang up and find a Mussolini and they will crush you. His exact those are his words. So he's again doing the moral argument and the practical argument when he is pushing this. What are the other small things? One is the Quakers. Quakers were a Protestant sect who believed very much in simple living, not in ostentatious living. Many of these companies, Barclays, Reckitt Coleman, Cadbury's, uh, Roundtree, uh, these are all Quaker companies, started by Quakers in the 19th century. In fact, Cadbury's was started, I bet even Derek O'Brien doesn't know, but I do. Cadbury's was started because Mr. Cadbury wanted to get the English working class off of alcohol and move them to drinking a healthy drink called drinking cocoa. Anyway, so they were started with intentions like that. So the Quakers were, they were, by the way, they were early in the anti-slavery campaign. Even in 1860 or even earlier, I think, the Quaker member of parliament was arguing for Irish and Indian independence. So they were always ahead of the world in uh, prison reform they were very active in. And Gandhi had many Quaker friends, including the go-between between, between him and Irwin. Well, Gandhi Irwin Pact was a Quaker friend. He had extensive correspondence with Roundtrees, who were a famous South African uh, Quaker family. When he went for the Roundtable Conference to London, his first public speech was at the Quaker House in London. So he was quite uh, close to them. And and uh, they have this idea of stewardship, which is very similar to trusteeship, that they are stewards of the Lord. It's very important. And it's so uncanny how there are these kinds of connects across time and space in the way people think that human beings in different parts of the world at different times come up with very similar ideas, which are quite noble. In the 1700s, Martha Navarma, the Maharaja of Travancore, formally went to the temple and said, as of tomorrow, this, temple, this country belongs to you. I am only going to administer it on your behalf. It has the Lord. So the stewardship on behalf of the Lord is, 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 a, is an idea that many people have. But the Quakers certainly pushed it. Then Gandhi was very close to an Indian economist called J.C. Kumarappa. I don't know how many of you have heard of him. He was known as a Gandhian economist. Kumarappa came from a very upper caste Velala Tamilian family uh, in Tanjore who had converted to uh, Protestantism. Again, high Protestantism, Anglican, uh, Scandinavian, in fact, Danish, uh, from the Tranquobar missionaries. And this tradition of the Danish and uh, not German Protestants is known as the Pietist tradition. So Kumarappa came from the pietist tradition. And the pietists, by the way, had started much earlier than Gandhi, 200 years before Gandhi ashrams, in a place called Halle, H-A-L-L-E, -L -L -E, all in Germany, where they did pretty much what Gandhi did in Sevagram or Sabarmati. So uh, this idea, they had a printing press, they made medicines, 
they made cloth. Gandhi used to, you know, insist on spinning and weaving in his ashram. Gandhi was insisted on 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 uh, uh, making shoes, which I'll talk about in identity economics. So there were other little streams here and there that came in, but ultimately, I am arguing that if we put Smith and Gandhi together and revisit trusteeship, we will have not a complete answer, maybe half an answer, maybe the semblance of an answer to the moral quandary of contemporary market capitalism. That's the point I'm trying to make. And I'll give you three or four concrete examples. You become the managing director of a bank. You can say, my job is to make profits. You can also say, I'm the trustee of a 100-year-old brand. And I need to make sure that I, this, it's a trusted brand, millions of depositors trust it. I need to hand over this brand to the next generation of managers intact or better. That's one way of looking at the managerial task. Data. Who does data belong to? If the company says, we are trustees of your data, we will not let it be misused, we will act as fiduciary responsible people on behalf of your data. When Apple computer refuses to give over its data to the US government, the most powerful government in the history of humanity, what are they doing? They're being good trustees of data. Right? That's, that, that, that's an important thing that, uh, that, that we need to think. So these are not impractical ideas, is the point I'm trying to make. Trusteeship, and I think uh, scholarship, economists, political philosophers have to go deeper and study Gandhi more and bring him back into the classroom, into seminars, into our discussions. He's not going to solve all problems, but then nobody's going to solve all problems. Uh, not even Christ, not even Buddha. But they give you insights, they give you a way of looking at it. And that is what this complex figure known as Gandhi does. Switching gears, trusteeship we've talked about. By the way, I just was a little tiny note on trusteeship. Trusteeship, of course, comes from the word trust, right? I have to trust you. If I make you a trustee for my children's wealth, I'm trusting you. How does trust happen? Is that I mean, the latest neuroscience research would suggest that there might be a biological basis to trust. That we might be biologically programmed to trust each other, not mistrust each other. Of course, there are both elements, you know. Obviously, you don't trust the predatory animal that's about to attack you, but you trust your pet. I mean, these kinds of things are biologically programmed. And there is some research going on that if three or four of us are together in a conference room having a discussion, they've actually done this. And if we inject ourselves with oxytocin, our level of trust of each other goes up. So there might be actually a physical way to make us more trusting of each other. I'll leave it at that. I don't think the Mahatma would have approved giving injections. Uh, but you never know, he, was, he always liked diets and massages. You never know, he might have said, let's try this. The second issue is human capital development and Gandhi's contribution to education, which this country has completely ignored. Gandhi, right in the beginning in Tolstoy Farm itself, he discovered that he had a lot of people living there, there were a lot of children. So he became interested in education almost out of necessity. And he started schools in every ashram and he developed educational philosophy. He was a very good personal friend of Maria Montessori and they influenced each other. Maria Montessori had in independently established that children learn better when they deal with objects instead of with blackboards or notebooks. Um, and Gandhi, when he advocated spinning in education, was basically going back to some of Montessori's ideas. So he proposed Naitali, new education actually Naitali means. Unfortunately, it got translated in English as basic education. 
So a lot of India's elite looked at his education for the poor, for the villagers, for the backwards, not where we would send our children to. And it got tagged like that. It was also a political attack because it emphasized, it was very anti-English. That was a, because he was carrying on an anti-imperial struggle. The Muslim League attacked it saying, you're trying to impose Hindi uh, and displace Urdu. So it got into a political quandary there. Gandhi's big associate in doing this was a guy called J.C. Kumarappa. I mentioned to you his name. Kumarappa is very interesting. He went to England, like all other people of his generation, he didn't become a barrister. He became a chartered accountant, very empirical, practical fellow. He came back to Bombay and started J.C. His name was Cornelius, J. Cornelius uh, Chartered Accountant Company. Then he went on a holiday to America. He stayed back. He went and got a master's from Columbia uh, in economics about basically how exchange rates were used and generally the, the poverty problem in India and British policies. He came back and gave it to Gandhi. Gandhi serialized it in Harijan or Young India and one of those things. And they became good friends. He changed his name from Cornelius to Kumarapa. He Indianized himself. And he was very much in Varda working on Naitali. And again, we've completely ignored these aspects. Because what the, the, there is a distinction between the way education was looked at in England and in Scotland. And to this day it persists. Scottish people are empirical, practical. James Watt never went to university, but he was made a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And we still have Watts is the way we count how these bulbs, he has been given that importance in physics. He was a tinkerer. He took Newcomen's steam engine and made it more efficient. He worked with his hands. English education, because of the kind of stultifying influence of Oxford and Cambridge, was Latin and Greek and, you know, academic stuff, which is why the Industrial Revolution in the Midlands was all done by school-educated people, non-college people. That's how English industry got started. Whereas Scotland and to some extent Germany and so on, they focused on combining empirical practical traditions with uh, study. So Kumarapa said, let's start with spinning as a medium of education. Now look at Montessori. High-hand coordination, left and right brain integration, fine motor skills, all these come with spinning. He didn't say weaving, because weaving you need a big space, you need a spinning, anybody can sit and do, it's a small machine. So, the and then Kumarapa goes on to say, I will, we will teach the children drawing before we teach them writing. I mean, very advanced pedagogical ideas, they were coming, and a very uh, great attention to music, you know. Unfortunately, again, Kumarapa does some foolish things. He uses the word folk music. So immediately people dismissed it as backward. Gardening. Gardening was very important. Everybody in uh, Gandhi's ashrams did gardening. You dirty your hands with soil. And there's deferred gratification for children understand. You plant today. It comes up 22 days later. You know, there's so And today our environmental science... What do we do? We encourage the children to cram from some textbooks and repeat it at an exam and they have cleared their environmental science uh, paper, subject. That's not environmental science. I mean, the, the Gandhian approach, we, in, in NEP they have made reference to vocational education and to, it is to Atalji's credit that he started the Atal uh, tinkering labs in many schools. There is some recognition, but not enough recognition to what I consider a very, very central idea. We all read John Dewey. Everybody talks about education, first quotation will be John Dewey. By God, here in our own country, these two people have done some extraordinary contribution that educators, you guys should be reading. This is what is an important thing and there is a universal value to it. Children in Peru and Taiwan can benefit from using spinning as a medium of education and learning drawing before writing. It's not just for India. And tinkering we've really given up. And I think that has been bad for us. 
Even our engineering graduates prefer to sit in air-conditioned offices and work in front of computer screens. They don't like bending metal, going to a forging or a smithy or, you know, uh, those kinds of things, which might be why we have not been able to, it's not the only reason, there are a hundred reasons why India has failed in manufacturing. But one of the reasons is our human capital is too academic, uh, too textbook oriented and not enough I had coordination and fine motor skill oriented. Edison, Faraday, they never went to university. But there's no modern physics without Faraday. I mean, they worked with their hands. Uh, so, and that is not there in India. Jagdish Chandra Bose actually did make a few machines with his hands. That was under British rule. We made sure in India, independent India, there can never be any Jagdish Chandra Bose. If you look at the difference between the, the, uh, the leader and his disciple, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru sent his grandchildren to study in a British type boarding school. There was no question of Naitali. The idea of doing something that's of that kind doesn't, and we all then imitate Pandit Ji and we all send our children to similar schools and that becomes, that becomes the epitome of what our education should be and it produces non-practical people. It, and it actually this fellow Corelli Barnett talks about it that we imitated all the mistakes of the English. When there was a vice chancellor to be sent to Calcutta University, who did the English send? They sent Sir Henry Maine, who was a professor of law and legal history. When the Japanese started the Hokkaido Agricultural College, Hokkaido College, which they had to call it Agricultural College, who did they invite? They invited Wheeler, who was a specialist in agricultural and engineering. So look at the difference, history of law. You know, every Indian in the British India, 90% of the galaxy of great people are lawyers or bureaucrats. There's one Vishweshwaraya, engineer, that's it. We don't, we've, we've taken all their weaknesses and laid it on onto our system. And today, in, in, your, in Karnataka state, so many engineering colleges are closing down mechanical engineering, electrical engineering departments doing only computer science, so that all our children can only sit in front of screens and never use their hands and fingers. Got a good idea, why not? But it's not a Gandhian idea. My point here is this is human capital development. If Korea, Taiwan have achieved manufacturing excellence, it's, they took the German apprenticeship system, they took those ideas, they didn't take the English academic approach. In fact, G.D. Naidu was a tinkerer himself, and made had many patents for engines and so on. He was put in charge in the 1930s of Coimbatore Engineering College and he said, hey, we don't need a four or five year course. Two years is enough, I'll, the other two years I'll send them to the factory to work. You know what happened? The Madras University asked him to resign, kicked him out. Because the, the academic establishment was not willing to accept working in factories as a, as a, as a thing, desirable thing for engineers. The last issue I want to touch on is identity economics. It's a very new field. 2000 is when, uh, it's, it's actually a subfield of behavioral economics, which is also a new field. Uh, many of you may know Taylor has won the Nobel Prize. He's a behavioral economist, which basically goes against the Marshallian ideas that we are all utility maximizers and utility is really about money. That the more money we get, the better off we are, and we are trying to push that. What behavioral economics says is people are more complex. Uh, they're not willing to take certain risks to make more, more money, even though if that is a rational decision to do, because they're risk averse. You know, things like that uh, they have looked at. A substream there is called identity economics. And uh, Akerlof, who won a Nobel Prize many years ago for some other work, not for this, and Cranton, his student, have come up with this idea that we are all utility maximizers, including wanting to maximize our identity profile. In other words, it's just not just money, financial. Homo economicus also includes identity. So when you're a parent and you go to school, your child's school, what do you want to be? You want your child's 
classmates, not just your child, your child's classmates to come up to your child and say, hey, you have a cool mom. So all of us want to be cool parents. That's an identity, right? I mean, there are multiple, you want to be a kind boss. You want to be a tough boss. So we are seeking identities along with pursuing wealth. And it's, it seems to me, Kakaloff and Granton, it's a brilliant book they've written. They have looked at this and said, it makes sense. In, in West Point, they have something called the honor code. And that's more important than outright punishments to control human behavior. And fiduciary responsibility of a trustee is very similar. You don't want the bad name of having been in breach of trust, of having done something against what, you know, some way Lalba is taking care of Adinath's temple. He can't, uh, not only in this life, for lives to come, he's going to suffer if he starts stealing money from the temple. So that, that becomes the, 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 the reason. So identity, now Gandhi confronted a lot of identity issues in India. Because we have caste and we have religion as two major identity issues. If you go back and look at all the earlier Hindu reformers, most of their advice to the Dalits was become pure, give up, you know, unclean occupations. Even uh, Ambedkar would say, stop eating candy, do this, you know. It was, a, it was a, an appeal to them to kind of purify themselves. And then they would be pure and then acceptable to the upper castes. Gandhi reverses it. He tells his upper caste followers, we, you will clean toilets. Come, I'm going to clean it along with you. He is, is very, he understands that caste is a, an occupational hierarchy. What it might have been thousand years ago, two thousand years ago is irrelevant. When he confronts it, second is leather. Only lower castes work with leather. Gandhi says, I will work with leather. And he's against, uh, he's a vegetarian, he's against vivisection and all that. But leather work he's okay with because he's trying to make a point here that identity markers have to be confronted and dealt with. In, in the South African jail, he made a pair of sandals and gave it to Jan Smuts, the president of South Africa, as a gift. And Smuts, later when Gandhi died, said, this is the greatest gift I've ever received in my life. So the man knew how to do these things with panache and with class. Same thing with religion. There's no point in going and telling everyone, uh, give up your religion and become secular, which is you know, in the current leftist fashion. That's not the way it works. The way you do it is by having everybody, let's say I'll sing Lead Kindly Light, let's sing Raghupati Raghava, let's sing, you know, let's, let's kind of transcend religion identities while affirming that. So it didn't succeed, partition still happened, Jena succeeded, Gandhi failed. But you know, that is the other thing that we should be very careful about. When we are talking about philosophical ideas, this strange objection that's not practical, it will never work, it won't succeed, is not a good objection. Either or, Kierkegaard says that the early Christian fathers, the founders of Christianity, St. Augustine and so on, were not fools. When they deliberately set Christian ideals beyond the capability of human beings. That is what an ideal is supposed to be. And you work towards it. That you don't reach it, that utopia is forever a direction and never a destination, doesn't mean that the moral fervor to pursue it goes away. And I think this is one of the important lessons in Gandhi and identity economics that all of us need to look at. Because now we have hundreds of experiments. So the robbers cave experiment, they took schoolboys and they broke them into two groups of ten each randomly and said, you are enemies. They started fighting each other. Two days later they said, no, no, you are all friends. They, they became friendly. I mean, we now know that identity is, is plastic, it's moldable, it's, and it's complex, and that we do seek. Avatya said when uh, I sent him a copy of this book, uh, this is one of the points he made. He said, listen, you're talking about praise. You know, you're seeking the praise 
of your conscience or of the external spectator. He said there's two things. To seek praise from others is good because you want praise and that's what human beings do. But to do something praiseworthy irrespective of whether you get praise from others is equally important. And I think those are the kind, I mean, where we still read Spinoza is dead 300, 400 years. We still read because they give us insights. Uh, we can still read where Krishna and, and get, you know, your hair can stand up for what the, the philosophical insight there is. And that is what Gandhi provides. Simply looking at him as a, a garden saint or as a political tactician uh, is, or even as a witness to history. Most people have written of Gandhi purely as a witness to history or as an agent in history in a particular political context. But I think to think of him in the mold of a Jefferson or a Hamilton who was active in politics but who also made a political economy contribution to, to our philosophical uh, positions in the world, I think that is important. The nearest I can think of of practical politicians who did that, I can think of a Jefferson and Hamilton and I think Gandhi is in that range uh, and it is high time that Indian universities started exploring both his universalism is important for all, not just for Indians and the fact that he has some illuminating insights and ideas that are relevant now and frankly will be relevant even a hundred years from now because that is the nature of universal ideas. They never fade away and we should transcend simple objections that they are not practical and look at how in fact, in, in Gandhi's case, actually, it's a pretty silly objection because many of his ideas are very, very practical. I, I think our children will be better off if we gave them spinning wheels and they got better eye-hand coordination. So to suggest that they're not practical ideas is silly. But anyway, but that's not the only measure. The measure has to be the moral intensity uh, that, that the idea uh, reverberates with.